In this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, we analyze the wreckage of the submersible Titan. Hey, what's going on with shipping? Sal Mercagliano here. So we're going to take a look at this wreckage that was brought ashore in St. John's, Newfoundland. A lot of images, pictures that came ashore from it, and a lot of questions about what that wreckage tells us right off the bat. Now, we're not going to know definitively what happened to the submersible until the NTSB, the U.S. Coast Guard, the Canadian Transportation Safety Board, and a whole myriad of other agencies finished their analysis. You could expect this to last a year, at least, till we know for sure what exactly was the fault or suspected fault of it. But I do think from looking at the wreckage that was brought ashore here the past day, we can eliminate some choices and also focus in on some other areas. So before we do that, if you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into this. So this is an image of the submersible Titan. I want to take a minute and go over this minute because a lot of people look at this submersible and are, are, don't quite understand the submersible. So when you look at this submersible, a couple of things. Number one, so here is the bow. The porthole window here is in the front, the very front of the submersible. What you don't see is there is an outer shell of this submersible. So all this white is the outer shell. This is not the pressure vessel. Where the people are are beneath this piece right here, but they're under that carbon fiber tube. The way the Titan submersible actually looks, you have this dome here, and that's, this is titanium. There's a band here that connects the titanium dome to the carbon fiber hull. And then over here is another band and then another dome on the back. You don't see that because it's under the, this outside shell. So most submersibles will have a pressure vessel where the people ride in and then the outside skin so that when there is a catastrophic implosion or decompression, this outside area here is not really affected by it because it is not within the pressure vessel. It's outside. It's actually outside the, the body of it. So when you start looking at the debris, it's going to make a little bit more sense. Uh, let's talk about this for a little bit here, too. These kind of cone things you see here, those are the thrusters. These are the fans that move the submersible around. Uh, you'll have thrusters on each side and then going forward and aft. You have this outside landing frame, which we're going to highlight here uh, quite a bit here in a minute. And then back here, this is the rear uh, um, uh, kind of... a. Uh, maintenance bay, not maintenance bay, but uh, the rear uh, operating bay. This is where all the electronics would be. This is outside the pressure vessel. So in here are going to be all the electronics you want. This is the antenna right here that is used for communication. And in here will be all your other electronics, the batteries, uh, all everything else you need. Now, there should be a couple of weak points on any submersible. The first one here is the porthole window, which we're going to talk about. This is the window. Now, the window is not a, a straight round window. It's small in the interior. It's big on the outside because the way it's shaped is like a it's almost like a, a pyramid. And that pyramid is pushing in. You want the pressure pushing against the window. And that's meant to push it in. But it is secure in there. Uh, the other weak point on this submersible is going to be that tubular hull that's underneath this white part. That is that carbon fiber. Uh, hull that is put together and then there's another cap very similar to this cap on the very back here and it's on that cap I'm going to assume is where the wiring comes into it that's the other weak point usually on a submersible you got to bring wiring in so that you can power you know the computers the lights and everything else like that is coming in and that's through a sealed area that is pressurized for it so most of what you see here is not pressure vessel at all. The only part of the pressure vessel you see is really this porthole window. And I'm going to keep this image up here in the upper uh, upper left part of the screen so that we can reference back to it. All right, so these are pictures that were done by CBC, BBC. I pulled them off of a variety of sites here, and I want to kind of reference them here for you. So one of the ones, obviously, you see is this one. This is the bow. This is that area of the porthole window that you see. Now, you see that red strap going through there. I'm really interested about this because the porthole window is missing. It is not there. Now, did that get blown out during the implosion when the Titan would have imploded? And there's several videos out on this. I really don't want to show you a video of an implosion because it's really gruesome. And, and to tell you the truth, a lot of them are wrong because they'll show the outer part of this crumpling and it's not correct. But there is a question about when the if it's the carbon fiber hull crunched. And, and, and basically restricted down 
would it have pushed out, shot out the window that was in there or, or did they remove it? That's a question I have right off the bat. Because they're putting this strap right here through the window like this, uh, I'm wondering whether or not the window was initially placed or not. Again, I can't make a determination just based on that picture, but it makes me think about that. And this is exactly the area where you see it there, right there on the bow. That's where you see them basically having that porthole window at. All right, the next part here. So the next part here, you'll see a lot of wreckage coming off that looks per pretty good, actually. It looks like uh, it seems to be in a good deal of, uh, you know, it seems to be almost perfectly good, like this section here. I mean, you can see wiring, you can see all the mechanics on it. This is outside the pressure vessel. This is not where the people are inside. It is not in the air bubble that is a submersible submarine. And this section specifically is the rear equipment bay. You can see right here that antenna. That antenna right there, that's the antenna that's sticking up here on the picture above me, oh, on the picture above me, right, right about here, just to the left of rear cover, that is that antenna. And understand this submersible was maintaining communication through a very low frequency radio that was going back. It was allowed them to communicate with each other through text, but it also sent a position to each other. And you'll hear a lot of people talking about it, James Cameron, probably the most famously, talking about that this submersible, when it lost communication and lost position, he knew all of a sudden that, well, this submersible had basically imploded. I would argue, yeah, that's definitely one of the things, and we know that's what happened. However, you can lose communication, and we know that this submersible had lost communication before. So again, I, I think there's a lot of issues here that people are, are jumping to the gun to that it's very easy after the fact to sit there and say, well, this was going to be an implosion, which we do know now. Some more of these equipment coming off. Again, this is some of that outer shell we see coming off. So you see a lot of this plating coming off. And, and again, it's going to look uh, in pretty good shape because when the submersible imploded, it doesn't push against the outer hull there. It's going to go in. And so what happens is, is this, these pieces are basically going to fall off. And this is what you see with this equipment coming on board. And you can see the remnants of that. One of the things that I didn't see and you wouldn't see it is obviously the tubular inner hull, that carbon fiber tubular inner hull. In an earlier video, I talked about the idea that it could be crunched together and uh, kind of like metal, like a metal pipe would be crunched together. Well, talk to a lot of people and uh, talk to a lot of scientists and a lot of different people. And that's not the way carbon fiber is going to react. It's going to shatter. It's going to come in and just come, dissolve into pieces. And so one of the things I'll be really interested because you would not see this coming off the vessel is those shards, those pieces coming off. So I'm wondering if they gathered some of those pieces together. So this piece coming off is another interesting one. This is the ring that joins together the two titanium caps at the end to the carbon fiber uh, mid-body. You can see right here the titanium end rings. So you see each of them at each side. This is what joins together the caps, and then you have to glue this end ring onto the carbon fiber mid-body. And hopefully they obtain both end rings. There's two of them. And not exactly sure because there's a lot of pictures here and I didn't catch whether or not they lifted one or two of these. I think they got both of them off because I know they got the other cap off. So they should have both of these off. These are going to be really, really important because this is the end ring that connects to the carbon fiber hull. So really looking at that to see what's left on there, you know, is, is the entire carbon fiber uh, hull still glued there or did it separate and come apart and was it a failure of the glue or did the uh, uh, implosion happen at another point so this is going to be really important to take a look at and then this this is the one that caught me the most i'm not going to lie this is the one that jumped out at me these are the landing frames coming in and if you look at some of those video implosion videos one of the things that i would think would happen in an implosion is that the center section would give way and the two titanium cap ends along with the rings would fold into each other. They would kind of crap, cra uh, kind of crash into each other. And that would basically pull and bend the landing frames. You don't see that here in the landing frames. Those landing frames look pretty straight to me, which kind of tells me that, okay, either the there was an internal implosion that didn't grab those outer elements and pull them in, 
or they shed it. One of the things they could have done in an effort to surface is drop this landing frame. So I'm really wondering if this landing frame was dropped because they look pretty good condition to be in. I, I don't see too, too much damage to them. And so again, one of the things you do in an investigation like this is you start ruling out possibilities. You start really kind of getting rid of things. And so one of the things we don't have here is where was this material found on the ocean floor? Was it found close together? If it was found close together, that'd be an indication that the implosion happened at or near bottom. If they were found over a large distance, then we know it happened at a higher altitude than the bottom. We know they lost communication about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes into the dive. It takes about two to two and a half hours to get to the surface. And, you know, things like, okay, where was the landing frame? Was the landing frame somewhere else than where the debris was? Did they drop it? Because as they're descending, if they drop that, they would still keep drifting with the, with, with the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream would still be moving them as they're dropping, and, and these different hull forms move differently in the water. So having a good map that shows you where they found all this debris, the caps, the rings, uh, the, the, the rear equipment bay, the landing gear, any of the shards from the inner pressure hull are going to be really important to have because that's going to allow you to forensically reconstruct what happened here. Uh, again, we just don't know. Uh, obviously, the, the, the main culprit here is the carbon fiber mid-body. That's what everybody is focusing in on. But you have to conclusively prove that. We have to know that w is what the cause was. Again, you were missing the front porthole window. Was that taken out to help lift that ring? Conceivably, yeah. I mean, that, that's easily could have been done. Was there a leakage from where the power and cables came into the submersible? Uh, was there some other thing that, that caused uh, it to happen? Did they lose power, uh, unable to control their, their descent and crash into something, thereby causing the implosion? I, I mean, again, there are multiple issues here that we just don't know yet. But I think the evidence coming up is really conclusive. I want to talk about one last thing because it's a very dicey thing and I want to be very careful about talking about it. You're hearing this comment about human remains being in the, the wreckage. That's not entirely surprising, but let's be clear about something. When you suffer a catastrophic implosion like this submersible did, you're talking about milliseconds from the period when it started to when it's over. And the air would have collapsed so rapidly inside that it actually would have superheated to almost the temperature of the sun. And so when you start talking about human remains, you're talking about remains that would require DNA analysis to figure out who it is. Uh, you, you are not going to find sizable, recognizable features, probably. Now, again, probably. There, there's always the oddball chance that something does remain. But more than likely, you got to be careful about this and saying this and getting hopes up of, of family members in particularly. Uh, it's going to be a very kind of grisly and, 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 and not very nice, pleasant uh, deal to to analyze this and figure out exactly how it happened. But I wanted to take the time and break this down because I think it's really important for us to know why this happens. As I said before, this submersible was revolutionary using new technology, new composition. Uh, does that mean we should never use this technology in this composition again? I don't know. That's what we want to find out. But, you know, this has happened in the past with other technologies and other material that was used either improperly or not enough testing was done. But down, down the road, it was later found to be a, a, a potential solution. So anyway, hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social, ugh, share it across social media, and if you can, give it a thumbs up. Also, hey, support the page. How do you do that? You hit the super thanks button down below or take a moment and go ahead and become a patron of the page. How do you do that? Well, you can hit the Patreon uh, uh, icon that's going to come up here or head on over to the bottom of the page there in the show notes and you become a monthly or yearly subscriber and supporter of the page. I appreciate everyone who supports the page. We just went over 100,000 subscribers. Big time here for what's going on with shipping. We're back doing our normal shipping News just did our weekly What the Ship. Got more videos coming out this week on what's going on globally with, inter with uh, commercial shipping. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.